We'll start listening to all of the fears, all of the doubts that start coming up within you. And ironically, what will also happen through your law of attraction is everyone around you will start reflecting your fears and your doubts back on you. Who's had that happen to them? All right. So you go and talk to somebody, your soul sings. So you go and talk to people about it, right? Because your soul singing. Then, then they, they, your soul starts sinking. And at the same time, you get all of these other people around you who you've now spoken to, all saying what to you? You know, oh, this doesn't sound good to me, you know. You know, this guy seems to be, you know, he's misleading you. You know, you f look what you're feeling now. See, see, you're feeling bad now. That's the results of, and so forth and so forth, right? And so we go into this state where we want to actually deny the emotion that is the actual error-based emotions that we do need to release inside of us. So when we go into denial, generally we go into a few different states. The fear state is one of those states. What other states are there in that place? Anger. Anger. Anxiety. Yep, so anxiety would be fear based. Anger based is stuff. So how many of you have felt times when you've started to really get angry for the like and you've never been this angry for a long, long time? Yeah. Right, so that that's what will happen ever. in this ever. or ever, yeah. yeah. Now remember that the anger is the choice to deny. So it actually means that you're in a state where you're wanting to run away from the real causal emotion in most cases. Now remember when I spoke about anger some time ago, I said there's two different types of anger. I said there's a childhood rage type of anger where you're a little like a child stamping up and down on the ground and, and having a fit. Or there's this adult, huge, resentful type of anger where you want to hurt and punish others and do all of those kind of things. Now, one type of anger is processing emotion. The other type of anger is the denial of emotion. And it's very important that you can recognise within yourself and within other people the difference between those two states. So, if I'm in a state where I'm getting into resistance, where I'm getting into this anger place, where I feel resentful and I feel all of those kind of emotions, I need to look seriously at what I am trying to run away from. Now, most of the time, we try to run away from things because we, are, we, we, we get so much judgment from everyone around us about what we're trying to do that straight away we start judging ourselves about what we're trying to do. And then we shut ourselves down. And the only thing that can happen after we shut ourselves down, which is denying our emotion, is one of these things. There's a third place. How do you spell alternatives? We look for alternatives. We search for alternatives. Now what do I mean by that? We say to ourselves, well, yeah, AJ doesn't know everything about emotional processing. And, you know, I've had 30 years of, uh, of stuff too, you know, like, so, and I've heard that this tapping thing really works, and I've heard that this other thing really works, and I've heard that this you know, touching certain parts of your body will cause you to, to, to get to your emotions, is what we often say, to ourselves. And so what we try then is we try less, less in our face alternatives to dealing with the emotion. How many of you have tried this in the last few months? Like, tried to actually say, no, let's go down a different path here because it's just still getting a bit complicated. Like, most people do at some point. So what I wanted to do today, just briefly before I got started on the real topic I wanted to talk about, is I wanted to warn you in advance that you will probably go through these cycles. And you will probably get to a point when you're in some dark emotions, you'll probably get to a point where you want to get out of those emotions and you will possibly get to a point where you will want to do anything you can to get out of it. And you need to notice what's going on inside of you at that moment. Now at that moment, the moment that you choose to get away from what I would call the divine truth, the truth about how the soul really works, 
you will actually at that moment also be the most amount, have the most amount of spirit influence trying to get you out of that place as well. Now the reason why that's happening today is that there's a whole band of spirits in the first sphere of the spirit world. So those of you, how many haven't seen the introductory DVDs? Is there any who just haven't seen? Just a few of you. My suggestion is if you can watch those, you'll understand some of the things that I'm talking about. But in the first sphere of the spirit world, there is a whole huge band of spirits who, who want the earth to remain in its current condition or be in a worse condition. Why? The reason why is that they actually use people on earth to actually satisfy their own emotional injuries. Right? So let's say I'm a drunkard who's just passed into the spirit world. I can't get drink in the spirit world anymore, so what do I want? I want to go with a guy who I can connect to and overcloak in a material sense, get him to drink himself senseless, and that way I can have some of that feeling. Now if I'm a guy who's just passed into the spirit world, and because I've been a bit of a dark, you know, dark in terms of my emotions, guy on earth with regard to the way I've treated women, I'm surrounded instead of by all these lovely women that I'd like to have relationships with, I'm surrounded by all these men who are the same as me. <laughs> now, how would you feel if you were like that? <laughs> so what does he do? He comes back to earth and he tries to find some men on earth that he can actually vicariously satisfy some of those sexual based emotions that he's got going on. Now if you multiply that by millions and millions and millions and millions of spirits, there are billions of spirits in this state, you can see how much influence there is on earth to do things negatively. Now the only way they can manipulate you is for you to deny your emotions. Because if you accept all of your emotions, they can't manipulate them. So the problem is, is when you get into this state, you are actually from that moment allowing yourself now to be heavily manipulated and you won't even probably notice it because you're in the anger or you're in the fear or you're in the doubt or you're in whatever it is the emotion you're in and instead of owning it and experiencing it what you're doing instead is denying it and as soon as you deny it that straight away leaves you open to manipulation does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Right. so my suggestion is understand that this is probably going to happen to you on this path that there is probably going to be a time when you feel the emotion inside of you is so big that you just can't <coughs> cope with the top with even contemplating experiencing it and in that state that is a like that is the time you need to be aware of what you're doing the choice to run away the choice to avoid is going to cause additional issues for you and there will be times how many of you have felt times that you actually cursed the day you ever met me <laughs> be honest, oh, I'm okay with that. Right. Yeah, there's quite a few. And, and there's more of you than that. Um, and that's, that's the way it is. And the reason why is because it opens up this Pandora's box of emotion inside of ourselves. And then, like, often when we're processing an emotion, what do we want to do? We want to blame the person that triggered it for us rather than, rather than experience the emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, if you allow, allow your soul to sing, allow your soul to sink without, without judgment, then it's rare that you will get into this third state of denial. But if you do get into the third state of denial, notice your own behaviour and your own feelings. Observe yourself. Whenever you are in anger, Whenever you are in doubt, whenever you're in fear, whenever you're searching for alternatives to what you know is in you, the emotions that you know are there and you're looking for alternative ways to get away from them, then all you're doing is staying or remaining in this state. <coughs> and my suggestion is try to reduce the amount of time you stay in this state. The longer you stay in that state, the slower your progression will be on this path. What are some of the clues that you can notice um, if spirits are influencing you uh, adversely? 
Well, it's very, very hard for a person to notice these things about themselves. So that's the problem, is because they're in a certain emotion, they're already in this emotion, and so it's very, very hard for them to now observe a spirit or feel that a spirit is influencing them because they're so much in the emotion themselves. Well, say someone else. But if someone else is noticing, well, firstly, let's look at the anger-based issue. Um, how many of you have felt like a, just a switch in you, where all of a sudden you're sort of working through things and fears and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden this, this sort of rage overtakes you? And then straight away you're off on another tangent, totally, altogether. How many of you have noticed that happening? Because there'll be quite a few. At that moment, a spirit is influencing you. Spirits cause us to actually have big changes, big equilibrium changes. Right? By connecting, and, and remember that it's the law of attraction at work. There's an emotion in me that allows that to be attracted, and then them to act in this way through me, I must have that emotion in me for it to begin. So that this is the thing to remember. It's all under your control, but not here. It's under your soul control, your emotional control. But the instant you notice big swinging changes in you, make sure that those changes have occurred from your own soul and observe what's going on. Does it feel real to you? Some of you will notice that there are times when your own emotion doesn't feel like it's even your own emotion. How many of you have noticed that doing this? Quite a number two. Well, it's highly likely that it's not your own emotion at that particular time. It's highly likely there's a spirit connecting to you through an attraction, and it's the spirit's emotion being reflected through you. Now, the same principle applies. They have to have had an attraction to you in the beginning for that to occur. So there has to be something in you that attracts that coming to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's yours. But if you are in the state where you're not judging anything at all, where you don't judge your negative emotions, you know, this is what we often do, isn't it? The positive emotions are fine. Like, how many of you enjoy, like, when you're happy, that's great, yeah? yeah. You all enjoy being happy, yeah? Nobody not enjoy being happy. <laughs> How many, how many of you, you know, have the feelings too, you know, after sex, you know, that nice sexual glow feeling? Uh, you enjoy that? <laughs> Only two people. Pretty <laughs> 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 sad, actually. <that's> <laughs> but there's all these beautiful emotions in there that we do experience. But the problem is that we start becoming addicted to them and judge, we judge them as good. And then all of these other emotions, like, how many of you like being angry? Really like it, like you really enjoy it, you think it's fun. Not many people have. It's a terrible feeling inside of you, isn't it, when you're angry? This stuff just boils through you and it, your whole body feels in a, in a huge state of mess and conundrum. And, and it's just a terrible state to be in. But when we get into that state, we still need to not judge it. Right? As soon as you judge it, you're just adding another layer on top of it. And that's the problem, is that we see all of those emotions that are unpleasant to experience, and then we make that extra step of judgment, and then we make that extra step of denial, which is where we go into this phase here. Now, in terms of spirits, as soon as, remember that whenever there's spirit influence, it's because we're here. It's because we're already there in that denial place. Recognising it firstly is about firstly seeing ourselves truthfully. Am I wanting really with all my heart to experience all of my emotions or do I really want to find an easier way to deal with my emotions? You need to be honest about that with yourself. Now earlier I asked, do you want to find an easier way to deal with your emotions? And only a few people put their hand up. How many would put their hand up now? Okay. It, can you see though that as soon as you want to deal with your emotions in a different way, you're already making a decision about your current, the current way that it's happening. You're already in a state where you're denying some emotion. Can you see that? Yeah. Just by making that, having that feeling of wanting to do it in an easier way, you're already in a state of denying an emotion. 
that straight away sets up denial of emotion. Always go back to the child. What does the child do? Right. So if it's sad, what does it do? Just sits down on the floor and cries. And it cries for maybe 10 minutes, maybe half an hour. Then what does it do? Gets up and acts like... <laughs> because it's completely dealt with that emotion. If it's allowed to, it does. That's what we need to do. Exactly that. And anything outside of that, any you know, a child doesn't say, oh, what technique can I use now? <laughs> oh yeah, that, that, that's happy technique. <laughs> so you don't, see, you don't see a child naturally do something. <laughs> yeah, like, no. Right, and I'm not making fun of you who you are doing that. What I'm saying is, get back to what the child's doing. So the child does that, just does just just lets the emotion flow. Alright. But the child doesn't go, oh it's my liver based emotions. Or the finger on the left hand. Like it doesn't do that, does it? So what do we need to get back to how the child processes? We need to get back to how the child processes. In the end, you will be like a child processing, but you'll be an adult in the way that you can handle the emotion. When I say be an adult the way you handle it, you are completely responsible for the emotion that you're feeling. A child isn't always like that, is it? A child sometimes wants to make you responsible <laughs> for the emotion that it's feeling. And often you are. And often you are. <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> So, so the key thing for us to realise is that every time we get into denial, we're just opening ourselves up. And, and there are times when you'll feel a switch within yourself. And my suggestion to you at that moment is to just stop and pause and just ask yourself, all right, does this feel like there's some spirits with me right now? And if there is, what's my law of attraction? Why am I in this state? Ah, it's because I want to run away from this emotion. It's because I want to blame... You know, there's somebody, I want to blame Peter for how he made me angry the other day. I don't want to feel that it was mine. You know, I want to blame mum and dad for, you know, how they treated me like a child. You know, when I was a child, I want to blame them and I want them, them to feel my emotion. Or whatever it is that we're feeling. Understand that as soon as we get into that state, we're in a state of denial. As soon as we're in a state of denial, we are now in a state of easily being controlled. You can't be controlled unless you are in a state of denial about an emotion. When you're at one with God, you will be so open to all emotion that it's impossible to control you with any of them. You think about, historically, what's happened even with religion or with politics or with any other type of governmental system. What happens? The way that we're controlled is through our, usually, fear or through our anger or through so these are all in denial states as soon as the populace itself enters a denial state who can control it easily mm -hmm. anybody can did how many of you seen that movie v for vendetta mm -hmm. yeah. quite a few of you seen that yeah. it's a good movie it's a little violent for those of you who are a bit squeamish <laughs> yep. why is it that the spiritual that these beings in the spiritual realms um, why is it that they can actually interfere? How come they're allowed to do that? Good question. Why are they allowed to interfere with us? Well, the truth is that we're allowing it. We're allowing it. The way God made things is that everything is based upon the law of attraction. What is going on in our soul, not in our head, remember, but it's our emotions. So a lot of people say to me, like, oh, you know, I had a spirit come last night and I didn't want them there and I was saying to God, take them away, but... But God wasn't taken it away, and it stayed there. And what can I do to control the spirit? The answer is, why do you want to control the spirit in the first place? Why do you want to control another person? Second answer is, there must be an emotion in me that invited that spirit into my life. Right. So you have total control of what's going on inside of you emotionally. And this is where most people get off the track because. They think the control is here and not here. I can understand that you attract on a physical level. And a spirit but, level too. But yeah, I, that's, that's interesting. But 
something that yeah. you can feel a certain way and then attract from from the spirit. Day. Yeah, yep, yep. Because remember, they're just people. <coughs> They're just people. They, and they haven't moved on to then a higher realm or a higher realm. But they haven't because of their emotional condition. That's right. yeah. Remember that progressing from one realm to another realm is all about how much love you have in your soul. So if you don't, if you pass without hardly any love in your soul or none at all or barely any, yeah. you're going to pass into a state where you want to harm others and when you want to influence others and you want to damage others and you want to hurt others even. Mm. Like how many of you have had emotions in in your own processing? Where you feel like you would like to have hurt somebody. Yeah, like we need to be honest, right? So so imagine that if you'd passed over with that emotion and you're now invisible, you think about that, it gives you a lot of scope for operation. <laughs> well you just imagine for a moment if you were now invisible, just invisible. Everyone around you isn't, and you are invisible. And you can see, yeah, he's got that emotion. Oh, I just saw what he did behind the door over there. Hmm, I can use that, right? Oh, I just see, you know, how many things would you now know about people that you didn't know before? <laughs> Lots of things, right? Yeah. Now, if you had a feeling in your heart that you want to use it for your own advantage, wouldn't you choose to do that? And that's why they choose to do it. We can stop <coughs> it by only releasing the emotion that causes that attraction. This is why many people who have been, for instance, uh, sexually abused often report that while the people who were sexually abusing them were abusing them, they saw spirits around them abusing them as well. Because when we get into states like that, when we get into states where we're not loving, we also attract spirits who are wanting the same thing. And the whole thing mixes together to create a certain atmosphere. The same applies in a positive way. Like, when we get together with a hundred people who want to work on their soul and who want to look at truths, what happens then? All of the spirits who are negative, they take one look at the bunch of us and they say, oh, I don't think we're going to influence them much today, right? So they go off somewhere else. And, and what happens instead is the ones who uh, want to help you progress at the soul level, they are attracted to you. So the same thing happens on a positive way. The problem is at the moment though, more and more people are getting to know about the soul, more and more people are getting to know about how to change themselves. Now, changing yourself is going to result in changing the world, right? So what will these spirits who don't want the world changing feel? What do they want? They are, they're afraid, right? And many of them in the states of deep rage or anger about that. Will you imagine? You've been drinking for 50 years through somebody on earth and all of a sudden that somebody talks to you and they realise they've got a spirit attachment and they realise it's because of the grief in them and they decide, oh, I think I'll stop drinking and I'll feel this grief. What does the spirit feel? He goes, no, 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 no. I don't want you to stop drinking. Right? And so what will he do? He will try to influence you to drink, why not? Mm. Wouldn't you? Mm. If that's how you felt. Right? I must have had a spirit attached to me yesterday who was really, really mad with telecom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to use my phone banking yesterday and every time I did it, no matter who I rang or whatever, I could not get through and I got so angry. I got really, really angry, but I wasn't thinking about why I was angry. I was thinking about, I'm going to get you and I'm going to get into this and I'm going to get what I want. Yeah, now just, I wish I can I mention when the spirit it. attached to you? It was when you had that feeling. Yeah. When you were angry, the, you were, that was your own anger. Mm. Right? But what happened next was when you went down to, I'm going to get you, mm. but mm. that, that that was actually some spirit influence in there straight away at that point. Yeah, I thought, I'm not, I'm not letting go here. And what I should have done was just put the phone down, stomped up and down on the ground a few times. Own it. Own it, yeah, and then do it. And yeah. actually those thoughts came into my head several times. But, I but you didn't want it, right? <laughs> yeah, and that is because of that spirit influence just wanting you to go down this terrible path. Yeah, because it was yeah. just so instant. Yeah. I was really cracked up. Yeah. And there's a lot of spirits, say, in the spirit world are in a powerless state where they feel like the whole world's been against them all their life. They pass, and obviously now they still feel that. 
So How long is that going, this war? How long is it going to? This war. This war between the spirit? <laughs> yeah, and as long as we permit it. Does that I make sense? I feel never ending in it's my not, life. No, it's not never ending, but it, it's a little, <coughs> as long as we permit it. And the problem is we permit it. We permit this influence not from an intellectual perspective, but we permit it because we don't allow the soul emotion within ourselves to be released. And as soon as we're in that state where we don't allow that emotion to be released, what happens? They can influence it. And they can influence it again and again and again and again. Right? Now, the more of you who take up the divine love path, the more spirits in the spirit world could see people changing. Because the divine love path a lot of it is about releasing the emotion that causes the damage. Now, by the way, there's a whole set of stuff that I haven't talked about about the divine love path yet. But part, one of the basic things that you need to come to understand within yourself is the emotional part of yourself. That's your soul, right? That is a basic part of the divine love path. Now, as soon as you get on that divine love path, which, is, which I've already described in previous times, as soon as you get on that path, what's going to happen is you are straight away going to get pressure from people here or in the spirit world who do not want you to be on that path. Now why don't they want you to be on that path? Because if you're feeling your emotion, what does it make them feel? Their emotion. Their emotion. And what do most people want to do with their emotion? Yeah, well let's say they want to deal with it Good emotion? No worries. Bad emotion? No. You know, deny that, right? That's how they want to be. And that's what I'm saying is, as soon as you get into this soul sinks place, you need to allow the experience of the emotion, but don't go into denial. Try to avoid the denial. <clears throat> the denial is a dangerous place for you. If we get ourselves on the right path, and we deal with all of our emotions, is there anything we can do to help those in the spirit world? Uh, just the fact of you dealing the emotion helps those in the spirit world attached to you or, or surrounding you. Yeah. See, what happens in a spirit sense, when you actually feel a causal emotion, the colour of that emotion comes out of you. They can see it actually coming out of you and disappearing. And your body actually brightens up in that area. So, I don't know if all of you are aware of that, but what happens is your emotion is stored in your soul, but your soul's emotions affect your body, right? And it affects your spirit body too. And so when you release an emotion from your soul, your spirit body heals in that particular region where you're restoring the emotion in your soul. And what happens is that they see the difference in you. And so many spirits who are here investigating this path, who are not on the path yet, are here because they can see, oh, well, they were a lot brighter than last time I saw them. And that, whoa, they don't have that dark, gucky stuff right in that stomach area anymore, right? And they don't have that really yucky, green slime stuff that they had on their shoulder anymore, right? And that's how they see it for me. They can see the changes in your own spirit body. And in doing that, they can say, all right, what has that person been doing to actually make those changes? And so do it, dealing with your own emotions can help spirits a lot. In, in dealing with theirs. But if they're malevolent, if, they're, if they want to harm you no matter what, all the spirit who wants to harm you sees is the emotion they can manipulate. So you might be like in a sixth sphere or fifth sphere condition on earth, but still have one or two emotions. Like one emotion might be left over is unworthiness. A spirit in the first sphere will come along, look at you, see you're pretty bright, but all he really sees is the unworthiness. And all he, he knows, the colour of it and everything in the body. And he, he knows he can manipulate that if he wants. All he needs to do is get a few people angry with you, get a few people upset with you, suggest to you a few things and before you know it you'll be off doing something that is getting away from that feeling of unworthiness. So AJ, you can get fifth and sixth year spir spirits influencing us negatively. And a, a sixth fear spirit certainly can influence you negatively. So he may be perfect on the natural love path, 
but what's he going to influence you to do? He wants to, he wants to influence you to not be on the divine love path, because he actually believes there's no such thing as a divine love path. He thinks it's all a figment of everyone's imagination. So what's he going to influence you to do? He's going to influence you to think, no, go back on the natural love path, go back on the intellectual development, go back on the moral development, but don't do this divine love stuff. That's all, that's all crap from his point of view. So a six-fear spirit can heavily influence you. I once had a conversation myself and Mary just talking about this earlier where in Greece there was this lady directly opposite me in this group. We were in this group and this lady directly opposite me. She sat directly opposite me because she was actually told by her spirits to sit directly opposite me. She had three natural love spirits, very highly developed natural love spirits, feeding her constant questions and information in order to try to disprove to me and to the rest of the group that the divine love path didn't exist. And she stayed in that state all of the afternoon. Now, when she left, there were three mediums who, who could clairvoyantly see spirits in the audience as well. And they came up to me afterwards and they said, did you notice there were three spirits talking to her? <laughs> they were telling her everything to say and she didn't even know. Because it mirrored her beliefs. It all mirrored her beliefs, so she didn't even understand she was being influenced. So this is the thing to bear in mind, is that even a spirit who's in the sixth fear can influence you to get away from your connection with God. And remember, this is what this is all about. The divine love path is all about becoming at one with God. So spirits in any level can influence you. Usually the spirits in the lower levels influence you in anger and rage and those kind of doubt, fear and all those kind of emotions. Or they influence you morally. So in other words, they see a little Achilles heel, a moral Achilles heel that you have. And it might be, for instance, for a male it might be that he just notices every woman that he sees sexually. <coughs> that might be an emotion that's in him, right? <coughs> And a spirit surrounding will see that. And if they're in the first fear and they want him to have sexual experiences which they can share in, they will influence that. That moral imperfection, if you like, that's in existing within him. And they will influence that as much as they can. What will have to happen for him? He will have to grow to a point where he no longer wants unloving transactions with women before that influence will stop. Does that make sense? <coughs> once, once he stops having unloving transactions with women, what will happen? No longer that spirit will be able to influence him, and they'll go and find someone else to <coughs> influence Jenny. Hey, Jay. Are there any other places in the first sphere that are not human races that no. could influence? No. Human Many of them present themselves as non human. So you often hear of clairvoyance describing a lizard-type creatures, and, and who's heard of that when they've heard of lizard-type creatures and all that? They are actually spirits. In fact, in the first fear, many times they are actually a group of spirits, right? That get together and project an, Im an image of <coughs> their condition into the person. Yeah, and many are attracted to it. Like who's heard of the dragon forces or? Many of you may have heard of that. Well, that's because people are attracted to these kind of influences. Why? Because they want to feel powerful. Why do they want to feel powerful? Because they feel powerless. And they don't want to deal with that emotion. But the spirits know what's going on in your mind generally. They can read it quite easily. And so a band of them can band together and project an image that will influence you if you are not dealing with your own emotions. So there are many projections of different types of creatures given to people on earth from these spirits in order to control them and manipulate them. Yeah. So no matter what you do, you can always blame the spirits? No. <laughs> That's not what I said. Remember I said, it's all happening because of your, attraction. your law of attraction. And what's your law of attraction based around? Your, your, own, your own soul condition. Yeah. So it's actually all happening because of your soul condition. In other words, it's all happening because of the emotions within me that I'm choosing to hold on to that are disharmonious with love that will cause these attractions. So that's very important to understand.
but it's all to do with those attractions that are going on. And Jake, last, oh, we saw you last weekend, three days later, I was absolutely flattened, could not get off the bed, I was just out yep. of it. Is that number two, the soul sinks? Yeah. You'll find that many, for many of you, this occurs a few days after you've come to see a talk of mine. <laughs> how, how's that, how many of you have had that? Yeah, yeah quite a lot, see. Right. Now, how many of you have then gone down the track of AJ's bad news? <laughs> right. And this is a common thing. It is a common thing to occur, and it's important to understand what's going on. And that is, when you hear truth, your soul sinks. But that opens up a part of you which is like got some emotions of emotional errors in it, and then you sink. Now the key is to allow that experience fully, allow that experience, that expression of emotion. Yep. And once you do that, then the soul will sing again. <laughs> right? The key is where if the soul is always sunk and never singing, then there's obviously things that are not being dealt with that you need to look at honestly. And I've had many times in my own progression where I've felt desperately unhappy for a long period of time. Right? And then I've realised something. Like just recently that happened to me with one of the one of the things that I've been dealing with. The, I, I've, I've been really struggling dealing with feelings of unworthiness. Like really struggling. I've cried about parent stuff. You know, first century parent stuff. Lots of stuff that happened in the first century and now and all those kind of things and cried about lots and lots of stuff. But still there was this deep core unworthiness with me, in me and I was starting to not understand like what is going on. And then through my law of attraction, like five or six or seven different people sent me things telling me what was going on. And even then I wasn't quite getting it, right? I was just, I looked at what they were saying, oh yeah, no worries, but... I wasn't getting it here, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know how you get told things and you think, oh yeah, no, that might be right or whatever, but it doesn't just resonate with you just yet. And then uh, I had, uh, Millie actually sent me an email and, uh, oh actually no, she sent me a letter, she wrote a letter, that's right, and sent me this letter. And she did, had done a little bit of channeling of myself. <laughs> Which, I come to Millie in my sleep state and, and quite often and talk to her. and. She's so used to it happening that, it, that, that it's a pretty normal experience for her. And at this particular time, she channeled me saying all of how I felt about myself. And I was reading it, I started reading it, I just cried and cried and cried. Right? Just reading it, because it was exactly what I felt about myself, because I'd actually said it. But in doing that, I connected with the amount of projections that I've been getting from the spirit world and from people about progression and in the process of doing that what happened is I realized what what the real cause of all of my unworthiness was and now I'm actually processing through that does that make sense yes. so let the law of attraction bring to you notice it let yourself feel it but before that time it's nearly three years that I've been working on what the cause of my unworthiness has been and I've released a lot of emotions in that uh, process obviously in that time, but there's still I still felt I wasn't getting at the, the real basic thing, and now I feel like I'm getting at the basic thing. And the same thing will happen to you with many of your emotions. All right. Yep. Big voice. About the denial. Yeah. myself and Mary were talking about about a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Um, what the question was, was how do I get out of this cycle of having all of this fear and then going into denial because of my fear and then getting out of the denial phase and recognising my fear and then because the fear is so great I get back in my fear again and I just stay in this cycle 
of, of, you know, continuously, if you like, feeling fear but never getting beyond that place. How many of you have felt that with some of your emotions? So that's quite a big fear. I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, Jen, I have got no idea. But that's it. Um, at first there was a concept for me of love, of what love is, and not knowing. It has to do with what this lady is talking about. Yeah. You know, I knew that love existed, but it just didn't exist in me. Yeah. So I kept that focus on that noble, that noble thing. And that's that part love of is that, that love is the answer. And as I kept that focus upon love, even though I couldn't exactly even conceptualize it, yep. it was so foreign to me. Yep. Somehow in keeping that intention, focus, I know what the word is, yep. feeling it, desire for it, that broke my cycle from fear and around. And then love became real for me. Love for me became real. That's it. Love for Graham became real. Love for other people. It became real. It just <coughs> grew like an entity. And, yeah. you know, and it brought me out of, out of that, that fear cycle. cycle that I'd identified with absolutely all of my life. Yeah. So did everyone hear that? Like, do you want me to explain what happened there? What Jen has found, and this is what pretty much everybody has found who's got themselves out of that fear cycle, is that there has to be something greater than your fear. And what's greater than your fear? Well, when we start in the fear cycle, it's not. Is it? That's why we're in the fear cycle. So the love isn't greater than your fear when you begin. But, there's a few things to focus on as qualities. The key, the key thing is to become focused at, a heart, at the heart level, and this is a switch within you, by the way. You will find this switch within you, where you no longer focus on your fear and live in it. But rather what you start doing is you start focusing on your desire. You might not have love and truth yet, but at least you have a desire for love and truth. Right? And you can start focusing a lot of your intention and a lot of your prayer and a lot of your longing on developing your desire for greater things other than your fear. Do you remember some time ago I mentioned that there are basically three things, three, three scales, I suppose you could say, happening within you emotionally? I remember I drew some scales and two, two of them, I don't know if you remember them, but one was the truth scale, right, where you have the truth, or I actually put truth at the bottom, I think, So that would be error if it's the opposite of truth, yes? And then I had a, a pain scale. <coughs> remember that? And remember how I said that if the pain is lower, sorry, is lower than the error, then the pain will never be, the, the error will never be released. And then I said if your pain gets greater than the error, then, then you'll start releasing. Of course, if you focus on truth, that brings your error focus right down to zero, if you like, which means that you'll begin experiencing your pain automatically. And in fact, you'll get to a point where you don't even have to be conscious of experiencing it. It just flows out of you just like a child. The only reason why it doesn't is because our concept, we're holding on to errors and we are not allowing ourselves to actually understand truth or feel about the truth or desire truth because we're so afraid of the pain. Yes. Right? So we become so focused on the pain and we forget that there is other things, those three other things that I listed. There's love, truth and uh, what was the third thing? Desire. 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 And other things too, of course. So, so desire 
Firstly, work on your desires. Pray about your desire. Long to God that it be different than what it is, if you, if you feel that you're stuck in a fear cycle. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Millie? Okay, I had it explained to me another way, yep. as in, um, like, the, the big forest of all the, the yucky emotions, and it's really deep and dark and yucky, and you're stuck in there, yep. and then all of a sudden you come across, like, a beam of light, and in there is this little plant that is hope and truth and love. Yeah. And it is there and it's strong and it's still, you know, it's like... It's alive. All this stuff. Yep. All this negative, horrible stuff. But it is still strong, it is still got <coughs> some life and it is surviving. Yeah. And we need to then focus our attention on that rather than focusing our attention on the forest of pain and fear and all that. Focus our attention on the part that is good. But I don't mean not ex I don't mean deny the emotion. I mean focus your intention on that. Remember that these things are like that you can feel desire for things that you are not yet experiencing. And you can stay focused on that. That's the only way I've survived this whole process myself. Uh, is by doing that. Because I've had no one to cheer me up on my processing. <laughs> so, you know, I've had to stay really, really focused on this thing that I badly, badly want and let that desire grow. Alright. Before you were on a bomb, interference from one level to the earth plane. What about in that level interference? <coughs> And um, that question I was asked by Graham about six fear spirits. But let's say let's say you have a series of you have a series of spirit realms, right? Let's say from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so forth, right? Now, obviously, the people in the first sphere are in a much lower condition of love than the people in the second sphere. So, if you get influence from the second sphere, it's not going to be quite as bad as the influence that you're getting from the first sphere and so forth as you progress. Right? The six fear spirits will just influence you in not being on the divine path. The fifth fear spirits might have a few emotions that are connected with that. The first fear spirits will be full of anger, rage, murderous feelings and all those kind of things and they'll influence you along those lines. So it just depends on which spirit you're connecting with, which depends upon your own soul condition, because it's your own soul condition that determines the attraction. So your own soul condition will determine the attraction to that spirit and if that spirit happens to be in the second sphere because your soul is about that condition then you'll be influenced by them. And if they're on the natural love path you'll be, interest, you'll be influenced along the natural love path on that, <coughs> on that place. Or if on the, they're on the divine love path you'll be influenced on the divine love path in that place. Does that make sense? So it just depends on this the... Is in, this is in the level on that, not the earth plane. The earth plane's in the first sphere. Yeah, but to get the earth plane, what about inter interference between each of those levels themselves? Totally. Every, one, every single plane, if you're in a higher plane of any place, you can go to a lower plane of any place. So if I'm in the second sphere, I can influence the first sphere spirit. So let's say I'm in the second sphere and I believe in reincarnation. I can influence whole hordes of first sphere spirits to believe in reincarnation just by my influence. Right? Let's say I'm in the second sphere and I don't believe in reincarnation. I can influence whole groups of spirits. Let's say I believe in that I'm a Christian. Um, let's say I, when I was on earth I was of the Catholic faith and I've now progressed to the second sphere. I will probably influence whole groups of spirits in the first sphere about the Catholic faith. I wonder about moving through the levels. Would you be allowed to interfere with other people on higher levels? You can't. But, bear in mind that it's different on the earth. Yeah, I realise I'm not on about the earth. But I'm in the spirit world, no. The truth is that a person in the third sphere cannot influence a person in the fifth sphere unless the person in the fifth sphere visits the person in the third sphere. Because the third person in the third sphere cannot visit the third person in the fifth sphere. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. So the influence is always top down. It's always coming from top down.
what's the best way to get spirits in the higher spheres, like the eighth and above spheres, to uh, positively uh, assist us in our journey? Well, that's obviously all about the divine path from there on. So, so if we're practically, though, what do we do? Do we, do we ask? Uh, we, we ask, or do certainly. we certainly? But but you can ask all you like, and if you have an emotion you want to hold on to inside of yourself, is that going to help? No, you see, you can see how I have to be totally open to my own emotional processing work. If I want to ask for a spirit in the seventh, in the eighth sphere to help me, then I'm going to need to be totally open to whatever help I'm getting, and I'm going to have to be totally humble about that. And that's where most of us fall down, right? Because we're not always humble, are we? You know, somebody comes and tells us something. What do we usually do with that about ourselves? You know, we usually want to get, point the other four fingers back <laughs> and then and say, "What? How dare you come to me when you've got all that?" <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. If we've been to other spheres. How do we know whether the bent spheres are a part of the natural love realm or the divine love realm? They're all the same spheres. There's no difference. Uh, remember, for those of you who haven't heard this information much before, these are the natural love path is through this spheres, but the divine love path also goes through the spheres. Mm -hmm. But the natural love path finishes at the sixth sphere, and the divine love path is infinite. Does that make sense? So there are natural love spirits and divine love spirits in the third sphere. And there are natural love spirits and divine love spirits in the second sphere. They're in each sphere, progressing, but they're progressing in different ways. And what I'm trying to introduce you to is the way that progress is forever, not the way that's limited to the sixth sphere. Hey, Dad, you said that, that your, your, your personal guide and guardian is assigned by God, so presumably that is, is the best help you can possibly receive, given your soul condition, but you can actually draw in other... Given your soul condition and your will, does everyone understand that? No. Right. See, if my will is that I want to progress on the natural love path, and I don't want to do emotional work, and I don't want to connect to God, yeah. what's my will? My will is I am going to attract now, God will assign to me a person who is in harmony with my will. Why? Because you've got free will. Because you've got free will, and who gave you it? God. Right. Does that make sense? Right. That so, sense. so what will happen is that God will assign, if you like, a spirit who best suits your current emotional condition, but also is in harmony with your will, yes. is in harmony with your desire. So if my desire was, I wanted to grow in the Catholic faith, yeah. who will I be assigned? I'll be assigned a guide who's higher than me in the spirit world, like in the sense of condition, but who is also of the Catholic faith. Yes. Most, most of the time. Does that make sense to people? Yeah. That's how it works. That's how what God assigns to you people who will look after you as to how you want to be looked after. Even if what you want to be looked after happens to be in disharmony with other laws of God, well, that's fine to God. Remember, He gave you that will to decide that. Okay. Isn't it true that the law of attraction doesn't, doesn't end? And so as you improve your soul condition, the law of attraction will then naturally bring to you, as Peter's soul condition... Spot on. It, yeah. It will naturally bring... And so you are, you are so what's the real way. asking? The real asking is me choosing at the heart level... Yourself. Yeah. Choosing at the heart level what I want. That's the real asking. That's what a prayer really is. Does everyone follow that? A prayer isn't this intellectual thing, oh, I'm praying to God or I want this. The prayer is not that. The prayer is actually at your heart level, you desire something. In other words, with all your heart, you desire this. That's a prayer. And that's what God responds to. He doesn't respond to this. This only goes as high as this. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> They are thoughts that fly out. Well, when you have a thought, they do fly out into the universe, obviously, right? These thoughts are packets of... They are things. Thoughts are things. And it's provable. It's actually been proved in physics that thoughts are things. But they fly out of the universe. But what 
what contains their power is the emotion in the thing. That's what contains the power. Okay, you talked about the causal emotion before. Yep. And it feels like you, you lay it down, you mentioned your own journey. Yep. And um, so, first question, how do you know you're at the causal emotion? And two, is the causal emotion the realisation of like, oh, it's something that happened to me? Like, like a, a physical thing or a mental thing, a, a realisation that Often that's, yes. that's what I reacted to and that's what's causing this emotion. Yeah, of, often. Uh, so the second question first, often yes, when you have, uh, you, you will realise an event triggered this particular emotion and you will often feel that event, often that is the causal emotion. Obviously the younger you get, the more difficult it is to identify intellectually the event, because you had less intellectual cognition, and so obviously you need to start trusting your emotions. But there will be feelings that come to you, oh that was that about that, that, that was about when I was three, or, you know, I was talking to Anna earlier, where you said you've had those feelings of, of sexual abuse, but you realise it wasn't yours, so whose could it be? And we are just talking about that, that it's actually the multi-generational feeling that many women have that they're going to be raped or abused. Does that make sense? And every person is going to have to release that at some point. So, you know, that's a realisation and, and, and the emotion flows as a result of that. Now, your first question, which was again... <laughs> How do you know if it's causal? Yeah. And it's quite simple to know if it's causal. This thing called your law of attraction when you release a causal emotion, your law of attraction changes. So let's say today I cried all day. And it was about being controlled by people. Let's say that was the emotion. I was, you know, I was just tired, sick and tired of everyone trying to control me. That's my emotion. I cried all day, and lo and behold, tomorrow, I have four, tomorrow I have four more people trying to control me. What is that saying to me? More crying. There was a whole lot of that crying. Sorry, it didn't work. <laughs> Who's been in that state where that's happened? Isn't that so annoying? <laughs> no, I've been in that state for months at a time sometimes. And I wake up every day more annoyed. <laughs> then I connect to that, right? Then we went through it. But, but the key is your law of attraction changes instantly you deal with the cause of emotion. And I'm saying instantly. Because if it's no longer in you, you can't any longer attract it. Right. So that's the way to tell that it's actually happening. Does that, everyone follows that? Is, it, is, that a, is that a gradual thing as well? It is a gradual thing, yeah. Um, because obviously you're dealing with lots and lots of different types of emotions in the course of a day or in the course of a week. And so sometimes you don't even notice that it's instantly changed. What you notice is, oh, two weeks time, oh, I've had two weeks now when no one's got angry with me. Oh, wow. You know, because I've, I've been dealing with those issues yeah. and had sort of things change where people have treated me differently and I've, I've noticed it, but I know there's still a lot there. Yeah, and so that great thing. Yeah, and so obviously too with a lot of our emotions we release, let's say it's the issue of being controlled. We might release an event in our, in our teenage years, an event in our younger years and the younger years and younger years and then we get down to one when we're three or something like that. Now obviously as we release one of those events, our law of attraction will slightly change. And then we release the next one, it will change a bit more. And release the next one, it will change a bit more. But when we get to the real core, it just actually stops all it, Like, whatever what we're attracting just stops all together. Could there be some sort of blissful, oh, just a wonderful feeling of oh, ecstasy? Could that be an indicator that you've released? Um, usually after you've released causal emotion, you go through a day or a few days where you feel really, really good. That is a very common experience. Yeah. Um, how many of you have felt that experience where you've felt like you've released something and the next day it's just like, whoa, this is an awesome day. Yeah. And then the next day, <laughs> well, we're back in the hour. <laughs> and this is how the soul works. You see, it's flowing out of you. So when you let one flow, 
you have a day or two feeling good. And this is where you can't judge. Because you're going to have a day or two feeling good, and then you have a day that's crap. And what, if you judge it, what are you going to do? You're going to stop that day of crap, which means you're stopping all the future days of feeling good. Do you want that? <laughs> really? We don't really. So just allow those without judgment. It doesn't matter who's judging it around you. Don't worry about what they're saying about you. In the end, it's not about them, it's about your relationship with God. And when you release that emotion, you will love them even more. Don't worry about them, what they're saying about you. Mind you, if what they're saying about you triggers you, go with it. Because <laughs> it's a causal emotion within you that needs to be released. It's your law of attraction. Hey, Jack, you keep speaking about release the emotion and deal with the emotion. Mm -hmm. And I must have missed something because I. I'm asking how do I release the emotion and deal with the emotion? Experience it. So, just, it so, it says so, anger. So, I'm really sad. Right? Anger. Remember, I said that anger is a denial emotion, generally. Oh, yes. Remember, I said that? So, anger is not a. You need to experience it still, but most of the time, it's a denial emotion. Uh, causal emotion. Let's say the causal emotion of my anger. So I worked through my anger and I realized by experiencing my anger, I went out there and bashed the baseball bat against the thing and got into my anger. And then after getting into my anger, I realized, whoa, this emotion of just grief comes over me. And I started to just fall down on the ground and I could start, I could start crying. But what do we often do? We sit down on the ground or wherever. Get ourselves comfortable with a cuppa and whatever else. <laughs> and we just settle in there. And we say to everyone around us, just leave me alone. I'm feeling my grief. <laughs> and am I feeling my grief? No, no. no I'm, sitting, I'm sitting in my grief. But I'm not feeling it. You will experience it when you feel it. That means that there will actually be tears rolling down your face. There'll be all sorts of things happening. Now, if it's a different type of emotion, let's say it's shame, then these waves of heat will be coming through you. And you, if you experience shame, you'll be feeling all these lucky, shameful, heat-type feelings coming through you. Right? It just depends on the emotion as to what the experience is going to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. As soon as my body goes into pain, what's happening? Denial is happening, right? unless it is shifting in me. So if the pain is shifting in me, then obviously I'm processing something. But if the pain is remaining in me in a certain location, I am in denial about an emotion. Your body's beautiful, tells you everything about what you need to know about what's going on within yourself emotionally. So allow those things to be experienced. Does that make sense? Yeah. What about when have trouble expressing anger? Uh, if you have trouble expressing any emotion, it's because generally of judgment. You are judging, you are judging the emotion. So then uh, what I do is I long to God to show me what my judgment is. Like what, what my judgment is about this emotion. And I sit down, and this is where you can use your mind quite well is you can sit down and write down all of the things you judge about this emotion. You know? What do you feel about grief? It's powerless, it's weak, it's... You know, and you just write down all of those things that you feel about grief. And they are your judgments about grief, and that is what's preventing you from feeling the grief. So what we need to do then is feel the judgments, and many times they'll have causes. And those causes will be in a childhood, I was three years old, and I started crying, and I got a slap across the face, and you cry again, and I'm going to belt you again. Right? So there's a judgment that now enters me as a belief that I need to release before I'll be able to release the grief. But what, what if it's anger, though? Like, I've heard mothers say, well, you've got to get angry, and you've got to hit a pillow, or you've got to be physical. Um, I've always... Release. Remember, I've always said there's two types of anger. There's a type of anger which is a childhood type of anger, which is to do with childhood suppression of childhood other emotions. Or there's an adult anger, 
And adult anger is where you get into resentment and, and rageful type feelings and want to hurt others. Right? A child in its own anger generally doesn't want to hurt others. If it does want to, it's in denial. It's in denial of its own emotion. So the key is to get into the emotion where you're allowed to be angry, but when you desire to hurt others with your anger, you are now in denial of a deeper emotion within yourself. And you're allowed to feel that anger, to go and feel that anger in a place that doesn't hurt anybody else. Choose to do that. Because if you choose to do the opposite, you're going to actually have more to deal with later, yes. not less. Yes. We'll talk about why in a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Does that make sense? And Jay, I was just wondering um, what you thought about the therapies that, um, um, you know, they say go out and use that baseball bat on a tree or whatever yep. um, to release anger. Because um, I've heard so many different thoughts on that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's good to do it some sort of, I don't know, other things that I've read say it's okay to feel it, but you're sort of leaving some sort of imprint. Like, you know, yeah, now this violence. is, how, how many of you have heard that particular statement, like, every time you re-experience anger, you're imprinting upon yourselves, like, the anger, and so you're just going to re, like, this is a common, this is a common new age type of belief. And, again, my statement about anger is, if it's a childhood style of anger, or for any, any type of anger, really, if you're feeling angry, the instant you dump it on somebody else, you are now damaging them and yourself even more. So, choose a method to experience your anger that's safe and not harming other people. As soon as you actually choose to experience your anger, and you will need to experience it fully to get below it. Right? So allow that. But remember that this adult anger that most of us get into at some point, is not the choice to experience what's underneath. It's actually the opposite. It's the choice to feel powerful and to blame others going on. And that is very harmful to yourself and others. So you need to know the difference between the two types of anger you're experiencing, basically. I have problems um, experiencing any anger. Um, I have a lot of guilt around that. Um, but I'm trying to get out of it. So you have anger. Anger is there. And then grief is there, underneath anger generally, right? And you're having problem experiencing anger? I don't really have... Do you get to I the grief? Heaps of grief? All right. If you get into the grief, then you're not... You, you, there's probably little you need to do with anger work if you're getting to the grief. So I just went to a workshop and I felt like... I must be missing, because I you know, think other people were going out and, like, you know... Well, that's because most people have all this grief and they can't connect to it, and they shut, they shut it down and suppress it with anger and blame, mm -hmm. and so they do have to go and connect to their anger yeah. to get below it, yeah. What, what I was kind of, I don't know, just wondering about is if, if they're in their mind thinking that they are actually... Like, you know, they're using the baseball bat on a tree, but they're actually thinking that's a... Take this, Mama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, that, is that still like the intent is? Like, uh, that's a better place than suppressing it. Okay. Remember, um, I said this last weekend actually that if you suppress any emotion, you are actually projecting that emotion to its maximum power to the universe. Mm -hmm. The instant you begin to own the emotion, whatever form that takes, mm -hmm. you are now you are now projecting that emotion less to the universe. And often it is a scale between lesser, 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 until you get to the point where you're actually owning the causal emotion, and then you're not projecting anything to the universe. You are now actually just feeling the emotion and releasing it, which is great. That's really why you need to be in the air. But it does take time to get from one to the other states. Hey, hey, hey just on that, really, what you're saying is some of the psychiatrists, right, have anger release sessions with yep. their clients, right? Yep. And, and I've heard of some of them spent the whole hour in there, bang, 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 they come out, run into their car, somebody cuts them on, they're off again. Uh -huh. so right. really they're not going down the cause. No. Yeah. No, they're using their anger as a powerful tool yeah. to avoid their yeah. deeper yeah. emotional yeah. issues. Okay. Yeah. And and you <coughs> this is a very dangerous thing to do is to use anger as a tool to deny deeper emotions. Because that must bring in more of the traction back on the anger. Totally. 
totally. And that, in that case, you are very much harming yourself even further and harming the people that you've just projected the anger to. Yeah. Likewise, if when you're releasing that anger, you're projecting it as if you're hidden from it, isn't that worse than recognizing it yourself? Otherwise, you're putting that out into the universe to harm. A lot of times, though, what we do is we recognize that we're angry, <laughs> then we judge our anger. And this is something you are doing. You are judging your anger a lot. So you judge anger as bad. Right? And, and the key, what that does is it does suppress you. In the end, you will get to a point where you don't judge any of your emotions. You just allow their experience in a safe environment. Right? So that's what you'll get. And in fact, you'll get to a point where you finish up not experiencing all of your emotions and you don't care whether it's a safe environment or not. You just so the moment you feel like crying, you just cry. And you could be right in front of work, or you could in fact be in front of 10,000 people talking to them. And you'll just cry. And many of you will get to that point. By the way, many of you will get to the point where you're in front of 10,000 people too. Um, just in the Does that scare if you? <laughs> One of the most difficult. Which is a state that I've been going to lately. Yep. I'm just concerned that I'm actually projecting onto myself. You are. And that it's really damaging. But it I is. want to feel it. Yep. So I'm getting very angry and very, um, just trying to let it all out of the middle of the cell. Yeah. But I'm feeling, well, you're not allowed to project it on anyone else, but here I am projecting. On you. Yeah. Which is just as damaging. So how do you... How do you deal with that? Um, what I've had to do, when I, I've had lots of anger towards myself. Um, and so what I've had to do is I've had to look really sincerely at what emotion underneath the anger I was wanting to run away from. We only get angry with ourselves generally because there's something deeper that is even more powerful than the anger that we're experiencing towards ourselves. In other words, we enter a state where we want to punish ourselves for the emotion that's underneath this anger. But you still want to feel the anger. You want to, you want to be able to release that. You and won't. Like that. Yeah, what I've found is every time I've done that, it hasn't worked. What I've found is I've had to allow myself to actually get into what the underlying emotion is, whatever that was. Right? And for, but firstly, I had to release my judgment, of my desire to punish myself. So the, the having emotion was a desire to punish myself. Why did I want to punish myself? Why would you want to punish yourself? Because you feel really bad about yourself. So deep unworthy feelings. Why else? Guilt. Guilt. You feel that you're bad, and so you've got to punish yourself for being bad. Why else? Shame. Shame, yep. A lot of self-shame issues that we're on. I'm not wanting to feel, so I punish myself because I'm ashamed of myself. What else? I've been punished by others most of my life, and therefore the only person I can blame whenever something goes wrong is myself, because that's all anybody else blamed. Can you see there's quite a lot of emotion in that? So allow yourself to, they're all capping emotions that we've just described, allow yourself to let yourself feel those capping emotions first, and once you do that, you will stop getting into this judgment of self this punishment of self, and you'll go into the underlying emotion. By the way, that took me quite a few years to do. I had huge judgments of myself, probably much more than anybody here has currently of themselves. And as a result of that, it took me a lot of years to get through that particular thing. And I realised in the end, emotionally, that what I was doing was doubling up all my emotions. Because I had an emotion that I then judged, and then I punished myself, and then add, that added to my own mm -hmm. feelings of work, unworthiness or worth, lack of worth within myself. So I was actually doubling up every emotion. So every time I had emotion, let's say I had an emotion of, I felt um, like sad about something happening. And then, I, then I'd say, you stupid, stupid man, you stupid man. Like, when are you going to get... I, I, I've done this recently, so... <laughs> so, you stupid... When are you going to get this, you know, like... How many of you have done that? Yeah. And, it, and I've actually 
<laughs> done that as well. I like, punched myself about it, and then, and then I start realizing, you know, all I'm doing now is is just direct, directing all this punishment towards myself. So I'm not loving myself. Why aren't I loving myself? And then it starts when I start dropping into that, it gets down to this just severe unworthiness feeling. And in my case, I've had projection of billions of spirits who hate my guts <laughs> in the first fear, wanting to harm me constantly ever since I've been reincarnated. And so I've got huge amounts of self-projection of all of those kind of emotions. And so it's a matter of me feeling all of that, feeling that emotion, and releasing that emotion. And once I do that, which is the process I've been going through the last six weeks, and you haven't seen me for six weeks for that reason. <laughs> AJ, what about the people who don't really get into emotions that um, tend to feel pretty good about themselves and then they, they do the projection thing, usually the blame is out there. When you get a bit older, you realise you have to do that. But I still don't go, I'm not a, I wouldn't classify myself as a, an emotional person. It goes there, I don't quite get that where you've been and, and... God created you as an emotional person. So if I'm not an emotional person, this applies to all that's, of us. That's the judgment. Then, then there's, there's reasons why I'm not, exactly. Yes. So there's a lot of judgment against being emotional. Maybe, you know, I, I can feel some of your parents' judgments about being emotional. Well, certainly. And, and, you know, there was quite a lot of negative projection at you about emotions generally uh, as you were growing up and all through your life, in fact. And so what we tend, have a tendency then to do is absorb all those beliefs into us. And the truth is you'll have to unlearn those beliefs. You will need to go through this process of breaking down your judgments about the emotion. When you do that, your emotion will start flowing automatically. You won't have to make it flow, it will flow automatically. The negative is... Any emotion, positive or negative, will flow automatically. Because the love is not a problem. And the positive emotions. Well, that's not strictly true. Because, you see, you can't fully experience love unless you can fully experience all of your emotions. So the truth is, at the moment, although you feel like you can experience love easily, you are actually limited in the way you're experiencing love because of this shutdown of the other emotion. Your soul is not capable of actually discriminating. You, see, you look at a child. A child does not discriminate between loving emotions and unloving emotions. It just feels them. Right? And it feels them to its full power. Now at the moment, you're not allowing your love to be experienced in its full power because of some of the other emotions that are there. Is that, does that make sense? I know you're going to probably disagree with me. But, <laughs> but the truth is, you will never experience love in its full power without actually having no judgment of any emotion. Yeah. Um, this is more of a dilemma than a question. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like how... It's, it's almost as if I want you to suddenly start floating up in the room and really oh, blowing yeah. something. How many else would you like that? <laughs> <laughs> just like, I just feel like... Oh, if you give yourself five months or something really getting into emotions and you don't you know, really connect with the reality of what you're talking about and what everyone here is for. Yeah. It's almost as if you're like, you can't help but feel but that it doesn't you're work. being dragged into some sort of cult and it's like a really scary way because you're so vulnerable as an emotional person to be dragged into something, you know? You have just identified the reason why you're not feeling your emotion. And I, I can see, like, intellectually, I keep coming back up there and seeing it like that. But for some reason, it's blocked to connecting with the emotion. No, you've just told yourself you're blocked. And you don't realise it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's like I just want help. And yeah, know. but what I'm saying to you right now is that you've just told yourself you're blocked. And you don't even realise that you've just told yourself you're blocked. Your block is fear about being controlled. Right, there's some really strong emotions there about that. Now, how many of you notice that I really try to control you all the time. <laughs> I love controlling people. I'm really, I'm really good at it. Yeah. I have lots and lots of followers. <laughs> the truth is that um, 
like what happens is that we have our fears triggered and those fears be, are our blocks. So at the moment there are some fears about being vulnerable. If you allow the emotional expression in any situation, whether it be with father, mother, sister, brother, family, partner, whatever, what will happen is you, you, are, you are afraid at this point that that open vulnerability will actually cause you to be in a state where you manipulate it. And I just feel like that's such a hard thing to do. And it's, it's almost like I just want to wait until you know, something, something great right happens on the you know, spot. start blowing and floating around. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many of you have felt that? Like quite a lot of you would have felt this. Like, yeah, sure, AJ's only do <laughs> And and he's not floating yet. He's not. Yeah. 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 He's not. There's no like. I can, I can feel this from many of you, by the way. So don't you say that you're not doing this. And and so what happens then is we go into this state where I'm not going to do it just yet. Why? Because it might be wrong. Right. And if it's wrong, I'm going to have to undo it. And how, we're so afraid, aren't we, that we, we, that we can't make a different choice. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is a big thing, the world in general is in this study, where they're so afraid of making different choices because they're afraid of changing that choice if it turns out that it didn't work so well. It's a trust issue. It's a trust issue in the end, yes. Yeah, isn't the opposite true, though? Because as soon as you do become vulnerable, it's, it just turns it around. Yeah, as soon as you allow that emotional experience of vulnerability, what happens is you'll start feeling your emotions and your law of attraction will start changing. But, but it's a hard place to get over. Like it takes, like it took me, to get over that place took me uh, nearly two years to get through that place of not trusting that my emotions would actually lead me home. And so I suppose what I'm saying to you is your emotions will lead you home if you allow them. But, but I couldn't get into that state myself of trusting that my emotions would lead me home. How many of you feel that way even still? Where, this, you know, my emotions are a mess. How can I trust them? <laughs> you know? And that's a big thing to come to trust your own emotions, which, which is really the issue. The issue of coming to trust that your emotional experience will actually lead you home to God, but also to bliss within yourself. So don't judge yourself for how long that period takes to break through that. Do you know what I mean? To break through that that hard layer on the outside, if you like. I just, I just feel like it's almost impossible unless you've got some sort of guarantee or certainty about where you're going. It's just like jumping off a cliff and not knowing what's going to happen. It's exactly what it's like. And it's just scary. I just can't, I can't get past it. I just feel like I can't do it. Because yes. you just look around the world and think, why is it just this small amount of people are going through this now? I can't believe that everybody else's law of attraction hasn't brought them this information yet. Yep. Surely there's more people suffering than us. You were dead right on all of those comments. Yeah. Totally right. Surely there is. Yes, there certainly are. Lots of you know, the world is suffering. Is it not stuff of mankind? And why hasn't everyone had this brought to their attention? You're dead right with all of those things that you're stating. But really, what you're stating in these statements are you're just giving yourself reasons to not trust your own emotion and to not trust your own law of attraction. Does that make sense? Like, and can I? Does everyone get that? Like, if I'm if I'm in a state where I'm not trusting my own law of attraction, then it's going to be very very difficult for me to allow myself to even listen to what AJ is saying to me. Right? And and it is hard. I know it's hard for you because, like, if I was AJ saying AJ, like saying these things to you, you might find it a lot easier. But the truth is, the person I am is Jesus and. You got just got to get used to it, right? And I've, you know, I've had to. It's taken me two thousand years to get used to it, but that's the way it goes. Now, it's true. How long is it taking for you to get used to you? Think about that. No, exactly. How many of you feel like you are you yet? Not really, right? It takes a long time, doesn't it, to get to that point where you know how many of us experience 10, 20, 30, 40 years of this 
trying to get to even know ourselves. Right? So the truth is that the, the thing to trust is your own emotions will lead you home. But if you get stuck in any emotion that's disharmonious with love, then you will not be led home. Right? So does everyone understand what, that, what I just said? What, what are the emotions disharmonious with love? Well, it's obviously hate, anger, anger, fear, doubt, judgment. And so forth, right? These are emotions we know are disharmonious with love. If we loved, would we have them? Well, obvious we most of them that we wouldn't, would we? Right? So if we're in a state where we're unwilling to feel our emotions or we feel it's not working yet, straight away I'm in a state of doubt. Is the state of doubt a state of love? And who is in a state of love of? Well, firstly, it's not a state of love of God, because if I, tr if I loved God and I trusted God, well, gee, anything's possible when you trust God, right? <coughs> if, well, didn't God create everything? So everything's possible, if you're in that relationship. If I'm in a state of doubt, then obviously I'm not in a state of love, right? Well, even if it's with myself, I'm still not in a state of love, am I? Even if it's doubt of self, I'm not in a state of love of self if that's the case. So if I'm in that place, I know, hang on a sec, even intellectually I can analyse this and I can say to myself, alright, I'm not in a state of love if I doubt. So is it worth me valuing that doubt? It can be there and I can feel it and I can express it and I can actually like be in the experience of the emotion of it, but it is, is it actually worth me holding on to it? No, and that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's how I do it. I say, hello, there's a cloud of judgment, a cloud of fear or anger coming over here. Do I want to value this or do I want to choose again? Now, I... It's not maybe what I'm, it's, that's not what I'm suggesting here. Maybe it's like I'm 65. It's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, that's not... What you just said is not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is to see the doubt is there yes, yes. and to embrace it yes. and to experience it yes, fully. I think you no, no, if you experienced it fully, you know, you would get out there, you know, yelling and screaming to the universe. <laughs> Done that. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd let yourself fully experience and drop into what's underneath, really. Yes. Uh, whatever that is, mistrust and a lot of other emotions. But but what I'm doing is trying to help this gentleman to actually get over this state of not wanting to feel his emotion. Do you follow me? You're in a state where you don't want to feel your emotion. Because I feel I can choose again. Exactly. That I have a judgment on that type of emotion. That I feel that I can do better. Why, so do, you, why do you want to choose it again? I'm not choosing it again. No, that's what I'm saying. Why do you want to make a choice? It's because you've already got a judgment and you're not realising it. But, but it comes up, a judgment will come up or fear will come up. Yeah, so trust that that's come from your soul. Yes. Well, you, so, so by you choosing intellectually again, you've just skipped over this emotion that's in your soul. And as soon as you skip over the emotion in your soul, another event will come up that causes the same trigger of the same emotion. And you'll skip over that in the same way, with your mind over that as well. And then you, another event will come up. See, your law of attraction is telling you that you haven't dealt with the emotion yet. But you're using your mind to skip over every law of attraction. That's not, that, what I, I'm not suggesting to do that at all. That, that is the opposite of what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting to allow yourself to experience the emotion completely, and that way that emotion will never be in you again. And your law of attraction will show you straight away that from that point on you will never attract the same type of event. So you never need to use your mind to skip over it anymore. You never even need to make a choice because it's no longer there. <coughs> Does that make sense, the difference between the two states?
I know it does to some others, but... For me, I, I feel I've been dealing with fear all my life. Yes. And, and this and is what's driving your intellectual... Yes, yes. And now I can, I can actually see it before it was hidden. Mm -hmm. Now, through going to things like this, I can see it. Yep. And but don't and make the choice to choose again. Don't do that. Now, what I'm suggesting is now go into <laughs> this fear. Really feel its dark places. Yes, yes. I've done, done that quite well. Um, you need to go further with still that. Further. Yeah, because there's still this intellectual desire to skip over. The, the desire to choose again for, comes from within that, you. To choose again so that you don't uh, uh, reject it. Yeah, but I'm saying that once you have released the emotion, you will never need to make a choice again. Because you will just live in love. You will live in love, you will be. Mm -hmm. And everything around you will automatically be a reflection of what you are being. Mm -hmm. And you won't need to make a choice with it here, ever again. You know, how many of you are exhausted with making a choice with things here and then having to make the same choice tomorrow? But it's tiring, isn't it? And this is the that's the natural love path. And what it does is it causes us to make choice after choice after choice after choice. We eventually progress. We do. But it's slow and cumbersome and we never will get to the state of bliss. How does that relate to this sort of idea of playing these old movies in your head and, and, and where we are, can turn those off and never have to play them again, but aren't we just burying the, the emotion that's connected with them? The only real way to never play an old movie in your head again is to feel and experience the old movie in your heart. When you feel and experience the old movie in your heart and release it by its experience, you will never even, that, that old movie will never enter your head again. Ever. And so recently I was having a conversation, I can't, I think I'm just getting the mirror, but we're having a conversation about families. And in the spirit world, there is no such thing as families, really. Right? And that's pretty triggering for many of you, right? Many of you are really, really like into family, hey? Yeah? Well, this is what isn't Christmas for many of you, just about that. All getting together as a family. If you don't get together as a family, it's like someone died. <laughs> you know, that's everyone's there. You know. And to be with Jesus. <laughs> but, but can you see how, like that desire to be with family, in the spirit world, you will get to a point in your own progression, and many of you will rebel about this. Me saying this, you will get to a point in your own progression where you no longer view your family as any more or less important than any other person you've ever met. And that applies to even your own child. I cannot imagine. Now most of you as mothers wouldn't imagine that, right? But you will get to the point that even your own child, your own children, won't be any more or less important than any other person. That Lucinda almost almost said that when she did the channeling, and That's people right. were asking her about, you know, what about your kids back on Earth, and what about your husband, and what about your family, and all of that. And when she said, well, you know, I visit them every so often, but basically I don't think about them, mm. and everyone went, whoa. Yeah, exactly. And the reason why is because your attractions will be governed by your soul loves, your soul passions, your soul desires. What's going on inside of you, right? Now. For many of you, me even saying that causes a big conundrum inside of yourself, right? There's a feeling inside of you, oh, I, I couldn't bear that life, right? I couldn't handle that kind of existence. So, what, and that's, that's where, I, where I am now. You are, no, you are no less important to me than my own sons are. And my sons know this. Sometimes they feel a bit angry about that, but they know it. <laughs> Does that make sense? And that's why I treat you the same way as I treat, you know, any other person that I meet. Because my love for you is the same. Do you follow me? Yeah. Now, now, if you keep that in mind, you, you will see that any time I am impartial with my love, I am actually out of harmony with love. 
And I'm certainly out of harmony with divine love, with God's love. Because do you think God treats you any different to you or to you? Or? Are we all the same? From God's perspective, we're all the same. We're all just brothers and sisters. Now, um, can I just stop that discussion for a moment, though? Going back to your question about how to get over this fear, uh, sorry, this doubt issue. You are dead right. You could wait until the first person reaches at one minute again with God. And then you could actually say, yeah, I'll go for that now. I know that it's real. You could wait till that time. And during that time, you won't know yourself very well because you're not letting yourself connect to your own emotion. And, you know, there are other things that will happen in your life because of your law of attraction that uh, don't get released. So your law of attraction will keep being the same as it currently is, in other words. And if you're happy with that, then go with that. Nobody will ever force you to change your mind, and even God won't. But my suggestion is that when the first person reaches at one minute with God again, and you notice that it happened, and you, th and you then realise that two years ago you had the opportunity to begin it, what are you going to feel then? Many of us will feel a degree of oh, blown opportunity, right? Won't we? If we did that. And my suggestion to you is allow your law of attraction to bring you these opportunities and then fully embrace them. These, these law, the, law of, the law of attraction is there bringing you opportunities that your soul needs for growth. Allow yourself to embrace these opportunities rather than walking away from them. No matter how crazy or outlandish they seem to be to you at the time, allow yourself to allow the law of attraction to actually see where it's going to take you. Now, sure, in that process, there will be times when you'll have to say, oh, yeah, well, my law of attraction took me down a place that now I'm not so happy about. <laughs> Now, how could that happen? It could only happen if that emotion was in you, allowing that to happen anyway. And that law of attraction, if you allow it, will expose that emotion, even if the experience was negative. So let's say in a year's time, I tell all of you that, you know, I want $20,000 from you before you can come to one of these sessions. <laughs> And you say, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I knew he wasn't going to give it for free forever. Like, I knew that he was going to you know, require something of me at the end. Now, if that does happen to you, and it's unlikely because I'm not going to say that, but if it does happen to you, your law of attraction attracted that. So let yourself deal with that emotion. What would be the emotion that might attract that? An emotion of I'm being ripped off all the time, or emotion of mistrust, or emotion of... Can you see? Allow yourself to deal with those emotions. If you can allow yourself to just focus on your emotions even at this point, you will already be ahead of the game. When I say ahead of the game, your law of attraction will change, you'll see it change. And in the process, what will happen is you'll start having more faith that it actually works. But if you don't allow yourself to deal with the emotion at all and wait until a time when somebody who's done it gets to a point where they can prove they've done it to you, mind you, they will have proven they've done it to themselves many times over by that stage, but to you it might have taken to that point before they can prove to you they've done it. When you wait to that, then there's really a few years or maybe five or ten years, who knows how long it's going to take, but there'll be years of your life that could have been different, that could have been more positive, that could have been more fulfilling, that could have been more joyous and happy if you had chosen to do it earlier. And so my suggestion is, don't just put it off because you doubt. See doubt as just another emotion. Another emotion that you need to release because in the end this is about your relationship with God not your relationship with me. 
Jay, Jay, could I say something? Yep, sure. Which just was, it's just relevant to this young fellow, yep. something he said before about uh, the little group here and if the rest of the world needs it, why isn't it happening? Many, many years ago, I learned that in the Aboriginal culture and the Indian culture, there were stories which paralleled with the Christian stories mm -hmm, in different right. ways, but they were paralleled. Yep. And it was virtually that Jesus came in whatever way it was with people. And it's possible that you are here, but someone is everywhere else. Well, you're in someone else everywhere as well. At well, you this can time. get highly intellectual about this. Well, I, that wasn't. That, well, I didn't mean to be intellectual. But true. But it was just. I was just saying that the that's possibilities with God are endless. Yeah, yeah. And and you're right. You know, there are all these possibilities from an intellectual perspective. But my suggestion is always go back to the emotional perspective. And if, if you look at all the cultures that you mentioned, all of them have deep spiritual and emotional yeah. connections. Yeah. Uh, if, if you see all the cultures that have been labelled spiritual all through history, they all have deep emotional connections to the earth and to each other and so forth. And so it's a basic thing, even just dealing with the emotions, is a basic truth. That's there all the way through the human race. Yeah. Angela? Yeah. I just wanted to say what's helped me. What's yeah. um, you know that we've had a lot of times where I've thought I'm right and you're wrong. Yep. But all, no matter how much I've felt that I'm right, if I'm, if I'm wrong, feeling that I'm right or whatever, and not in a state of love, it's like what you're saying before, that's only my truth. So it was realising that that might be my truth at the moment, but it's not God's truth. Yeah. It can't be if I'm not in a state of love. So that works with fear and doubt or anything like that. I've experienced fear. So obviously it's your truth, so it's worth listening to and experiencing. But it's not God's truth. Yes, yeah, so does everyone get what Angela's just trying to say there? It's a very important thing, actually. And that is that if you're feeling an emotion of that's disharmonious with love, inside of yourself, sure, go ahead and feel it and understand it and everything else about it. But the fact that it's actually disharmonious with love already is telling you something. Right? It's already telling you that actually from God's perspective, you're probably wrong. Because all of God's emotions are harmonious with love, are they? Not. Yeah. So any emotion that I'm experiencing, even if I believe it, it's the truth. It's probably wrong if it's disharmonious with love. So therefore, if we are fearful that we think you're a cult leader, well, we're not in love. We're in fear. That's right. So we're in error already. That's right. Whether, you're, whether, whether I am a cult leader or not, it's immaterial. That's right. So we're in error. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a great cult leader. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my hair. I haven't told you about my hair, have I? <laughs> um, I, I have spent all my life and progressed into religion looking for you, looking for Jesus Christ. I joined the Mormon faith, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, looking for Jesus Christ. And so there was an, I come to realise there was an emotional investment for me in that belief system. And the comfort for me now is totally opposite to that. That you're just a bloke doing your own stuff, <laughs> teaching us to have responsibility to go to God and find mm -hmm. answers. And in seeking the original thing for me caught up in that belief system, both positively and negatively, was that I just had love, seek, searching for love. Yeah. And you represented love for me in my life that led me through religion and belief systems and along that path. Yeah. So again, what I had said previously said, I searched for something higher and then it all started to just dissolve away from me from the realisation that you you just you are who you are and you're you're teaching us the responsibility that we have to ourselves yeah. and to go to God in our directly. communications mm -hmm. directly. Yeah. Totally. Like I, well, I'm saying to you, AJ, it's a big deal for me. It yeah. can happen overnight. No, no, that's right. These are big emotions. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big deal to come to a lot of these emotional, like, 
you know, once like <laughs> Angela have just stated what she was feeling about the ang the anger and fear stuff, and then and Jen about this stuff, like you hear them saying these things now, but she has taken like years of your life, hasn't it, to come to some of these conclusions, <laughs> hasn't it? Yeah. Nine or ten years in organised religion, totally indoctrinated, really. But I mean, in the Mormon faith, they teach about celestial principles. They teach you, you know, all about you know the vir the very virtuous things. But in the old, in the whole scheme of things, you only ever get to the sixth sphere where you you know you're looking to get beyond. Mm. But you, it isn't. The real, it isn't the real deal. Mm. It's again, it's a, um, a belief system that you've got to, for me, I had to break down. Mm. And as that process is broken down, I see you that you've just got, you're on a personal journey. Yes, the message that you carry is for all of mankind, but ultimately it's. Totally. Yeah. 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 And you know, it, deal in this. It took me, even myself, a long time to realise, in my own progression, that that my own progression was ex extremely important. Because what, what what happened a lot in the first century was that I pro I progressed a lot to the point of it one with God, and then I felt this huge responsibility. Really, I suppose you could say it. And I didn't. It wasn't a burdensome responsibility, but there was this feeling that. The world of mankind needs to know this truth, right? And in the process of doing that, and and staying involved in progressing the way I was progressing in that, inside of my own life, I often held myself back from progression, waiting for people to join me to realise this new truth that I've just realised. Do you follow me? Yeah. And and it wasn't until in in the 18th and 19th centuries and the, and the early 20th century that I started realizing actually that my own progression was extremely important in the in the whole outcome of what truth could be taught to the earth. It's almost like your own personal individualization or individual self, yep. your own individual self, needs to be able to get out of the way so God can work through you, so God becomes the voice through the person. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. And at, at a condition of abundance, God's voice will operate through all of you. And it will be a seamless transaction. You will still have your own desires and passions, but they will all be harmonious with God's. But I've come to understand that you can't get to that point where you can become an instrument of God until you deal with this, the stuff that's your soul. The scars. Yes. The scars of the soul, yeah. Exactly right. Well, I thought what we might do now is just have a break, because it's friggish. And then I would like to talk about this other subject, a completely different subject, uh, which is about divine love, forgiveness, repentance and mercy. It's a very deep subject from a spiritual level, uh, but it's something that is really important to understand on the divine love path. And I haven't spoken on this subject very much at all, so so it's something that I'd like to talk about with you after the break. So if we have half an hour or so, is that enough? Relieved. <laughs> and this next subject that I wanted to talk about is really, really important. Uh, in terms of understanding some of the divine love path of progression. And it's so important to understand because most people, when they hear these things, they start going down this track of feeling it's all very religious, right? And uh, my answer generally is, well, if I'm Jesus, then I'm going to say some things that are going to sound religious, right? Well, didn't a lot of these religions start with me? So, you know. And that's something that uh, I'd just like you to bear in mind for a moment during this discussion, is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about, some of it today, I'm going to talk about some things that I said in the first century, and maybe explain it in a way that you've maybe never thought about these things before. 
But the subject that I'm, I'm choosing is forgiveness, repentance, and mercy, or grace, if you like. You've heard of the term grace? Yeah. Now, when I say the word repentance, what does everybody feel when they hear that word? Punishment. <laughs> Punishment? Uh, making up for something. Sorry? Making up for something? They, and most people feel it has a real religious connotation. Is that how you feel? Christianity. Sort of real Christianity. You know, real Christian thing. When I say the word forgiveness, what comes to your mind? Letting go. A Christian thing. It's again a Christian thing, sort of thing? That's what it feels like to you? Christian thing? Letting go. More gentle. More gentle? Yeah, repentance, but more stuff. Hard to do. Hard to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new age term. We've been using a lot. You hear it in the new age philosophies a lot. Yeah, yeah. very true. More like ex-girlfriends. <laughs> so Mike thinks of ex-girlfriends. <laughs> and the need to forgive them, is that the idea? <laughs> Guilt. Guilt? Okay. Possibility to recover. A possibility to recover, to heal. Yeah. All right. Acceptance. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about what forgiveness really is, and then what uh, repentance really is, and then what mercy really is, and then how it all relates to God and your relationship with God. Does that sound? And I might not cover all the subjects in the time we've got, but we'll just see how we go. So let's look at the topic firstly of forgive with an E in the middle there, is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yes. yeah. I'll forgive you if you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many times have you heard that um, you need to forgive your parents for what they've done to you and then everything will be fine? Yeah. You've heard that? Like, or you're not yet at the point of forgiveness, and this is why all these bad things are happening. Once you get to forgiveness, all you've got to do is forgive them, and everything will be fine, everything will be okay. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, that is actually true. Like, the truth is all you have to do is forgive them. But I don't know if I'd use the words all you have to do, because <laughs> forgiveness is actually uh, sometimes quite difficult to achieve. How many of you know that? Like, no, in your own relationships, like you thought you forgave somebody 20 years ago when you left him, <laughs> but actually, now that you think about it, you're quite angry. <laughs> and it's 20 years later, right? So, so, and this is something that we need to bear in mind about forgiveness. Forgiveness happens at the soul level, not at the intellectual level. That's number one. Forgiveness happens at the soul level, not at an intellectual level. You can think you've forgiven somebody all you like, but unless the emotional signature of absolutely everything that they've done that you thought harmed you is dealt with, you have not forgiven them. Now you imagine for a moment, if you've been in an abusive relationship with a man for 15 years and then you left. And every single day he did something that caused this abuse. Right? If you are not at a point where all of that stuff no longer, you, you don't, and I'm not saying detune from it, I'm saying you're totally tuned into all of that and you no longer feel heard about any of it. That's a pretty hard place to get to, isn't it? When you think about it. Right? Let's go even further with forgiveness. Unless the causal emotion in you is released, you cannot forgive. I had a discussion with Dennis the other day about forgiveness. Yep. He found something in a beautiful book and I said, oh, that's natural love. I'm never going to look into it. Um, but was I then right when I said to him, Dennis, there is really no forgiveness per se, only God can forgive. We cannot really forgive. What I meant with that is, 
when only God can forgive is only when we really release the causal emotion about you know what 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 caused that issue. Yeah, and I suppose what I'm to be forgiven. Yeah, what I'm trying to do here is define what mm -hmm. I mean by forgiveness. Yes. Right. Rather than what the world means by forgiveness. Okay. You follow me? Because I mean, it's close. Because in a yeah, it's very close. In in the Christian beliefs and in the you know new age type beliefs, forgiveness is held up as like a sort of a pinnacle about your own progression. <coughs> and to be honest with you, it is. Forgiveness is such an important part of your own progression. But the key is understanding what it is. 